Thank you, Governor, for those updates. Good afternoon. I also want to thank you all for tuning in. The Governor and I are sharing messages every day, but we also need you to help us by being the messengers as well. There's nothing like getting information from someone you know and love. If there is someone in your life who isn't able to watch these daily briefings or who maybe isn't as plugged in to social media or the news, please help us by passing along these important messages that you're hearing every day. As the governor said, we have 220 new cases today. This brings our total to 1,450. As the governor also shared, we sadly have five additional fatalities to report. We now have 35 COVID-19 associated fatalities total. Of the five people whose passings we are reporting today, three were in their 70s, one person was in their 80s, and one person was in their 90s. The person in their 90s was a Golden Crest nursing home resident. The person in their 80s lived at Oak Hill, as did one of the persons in their 70s. While I'm on the topic of data, I want to pull back and return to something I got asked about yesterday, which is demographics and race and ethnicity. There has been coverage over the last few days nationally about racial and ethnic disparities that are being noted in cities and states across the country. That highlights why we have, for many times before this pandemic, spoken often about zip code and how much zip codes matter. While we can't say anything definitive yet about Rhode Island, we understand when these types of disparities occur. We are still building out our data system right now here for Rhode Island so we can look at things in a more granular way. And oftentimes it's because of the enormous amount of data that we are collecting in a very short window of time. However, we do know definitively that there are certain environmental, social, and economic factors that make certain people more vulnerable. We talk often about making it so that your health should not depend on the zip code that you are from, and knowing that zip codes can lead to differences in outcomes. When we have stressed situations such as this pandemic, those types of disparities are more evident. For example, if people don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables in their community on a regular basis, that contributes to underlying health issues like diabetes and other medical conditions. And we know that while quarantining and isolation are key guidances that we are giving, and that they are challenging for everyone, we know that it can be even more challenging for people who live in communities with less access to good, stable job opportunities that pay a living wage. We also know it's more challenging for people with unstable housing conditions. There's also the challenge of exposing many of the other structural inequities that occur. There can be differences in policies or discriminatory approaches across the country in place based on race and ethnicity. And we know many communities deal with that. These are just some of the examples that highlight why you're seeing certain communities now with higher rates of cases and unfortunately of deaths as well associated with COVID-19. As we respond now and in the future, when we start to rebuild and repair, we need to be very conscious of these kinds of structural inequities, ones that we have been talking about for quite some time, and ones that the numbers that have been asked about 
clearly make evident. Separately, I want to address the issue of isolation because we've received a few questions about that that adds to what the governor already spoke to. If you go into isolation because you are feeling sick, which means if you are not feeling well, you need to stay home, you should stay home and in isolation for at least seven days. On top of that, you need to be fever free for 72 hours, three days, during a time which you're not taking any fever reducing medication and all of your symptoms need to have resolved completely before anyone can be considered cleared of the illness they have, whether COVID-19 or any other viral infection. As a reminder, isolation means staying home if you are ill with symptoms and doing everything you can to stay away from other people in your home as well. That might mean using a different bathroom or being in the kitchen in shifts. Lastly, yesterday, I highlighted the need for healthcare workers who have symptoms to also stay home because that is critical given the population that they are caring for. I want to add two things to that because people are continuing to hear that message and respond so that the folks that they're caring for remain safe. We are working to prioritize opportunities for healthcare workers to be tested so that if they're staying home when they're ill, it can be known whether or not these are symptoms of COVID-19 or otherwise. Additionally, because people need to stay home if they are ill, we want to continue to make out that call for volunteers, particularly in our nursing home settings and other healthcare facilities. When the healthcare workers are doing the important work of staying home if they are ill, there is still a need for the healthcare workers to provide the care for the residents in nursing homes, assisted living, and other healthcare facilities. So Rhode Island Responds still needs volunteers, and we're also working on making ways for people to um, begin to get an accelerated license for becoming a certified nurse assistant or feeding assistant. So please go to riresponds.org if you want to get involved to volunteer and be able to assist, knowing that healthcare workers are doing what they need to to best care for the people that they uh, are treating. We are looking to strike the balance between having symptoms, symptomatic healthcare workers stay home, but also make sure that we have the staff levels needed in Rhode Island healthcare facilities across the state.